I'm Lynn Newsom, the co-director of Quaker House, along with my husband. Steve Newsom. And we would like to introduce Bob Barnes, who has come to be with us for a month to help us and work with us. Mm -hmm. We're so happy to have him. We have asked our treasurer, Kurt Terrell, to interview him so you can get to know more about Bob Barnes. Bob, you've been a longtime supporter of Quaker House, and, and we appreciate the time you spent with us here, mm -hmm. particularly with getting the Alternatives to Violence project going, uh, AVP, and uh, for the record, you've been an icon in that project. Um, you've also been uh, owned and operated a small business. You've been involved in education and special education, and you've been a draftsman. But we want to center on events prior to that, especially uh, what led you in your transformation towards a uh, more, more peaceful world and your experiences in, in the military. So to start, would you tell us a little bit about your early life, when and where you were born, how you were raised, and maybe some particular influences uh, that affected your life? And then we're going to talk about your experience in the military. Sure. I was born in New York City in the mid-20s, 1926, which means I'm 88 at the moment. Oh, my father brought me out to California when I was four or five. I was too young to remember exactly when that was. And I went to school there, to elementary and high school. Got involved for a while. I was part with my grandparents, who were Christian scientists, and so I went to Christian Science Sunday School, and then when we got to Another house, it turned out all my friends were Presbyterians, and so off to the Presbyterians, I went. My parents didn't really care, they just thought that I ought to get whatever that kind of education was. And they were not into that kind of thing at all. So, that's it in a small crack nutshell. And what led you to join the military? I had just graduated from high school. I was just barely 17. I'd skipped a grade one in my early, early grades. Uh, when the teacher caught me in first grade reading the primer when it was upside down on my desk, facing her instead of me, and then challenged me to read it, then I just read it right off. They decided I should be in second grade, not first grade. <laughs> and so here I was barely 17. Oh, what do I do? I'm out of high school. And there was a war on. This was 1943. And I, somehow or other I had heard, probably through army recruiters and all that sort of thing at the high school, that there was something called the Enlisted Reserve Corps. And they would take me to college, pay me, you know, all expenses paid, but I was then committed to go into the Army when I was 18, legally able to do it. So I did that, and that meant I spent a semester at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, and then another semester at what was then Pasadena Junior College down in Pasadena, California. And then off I went to basic training, which was at Fort McLeod in Alabama. And there's a story in that. It was totally new to me. Uh, I got into the ER, the Enlisted Reserve Corps, because I didn't know what else to do. And everybody I knew was bolstering the war as much as they could. So here I am in basic training, and here's a sergeant, and our platoon was out in the space outside of our barrack. And he was trying to teach us how to use a bayonet, this knife you put on the end of your gun barrel, at the, at, toward the end of the gun barrel, not on the end. And in the course of what he was saying, he said, after you stuck that bayonet in the body of the enemy, your enemy, you're going to have to put your foot on that body in order to get the blade out because the muscles will involuntarily close around the, the blade. And when I heard that, every cell in my body went off like a flashbulb simultaneously. This is wrong. 
absolutely, completely, unutterably, inevitably, forever wrong. And in that instant, I became a pacifist. And it wasn't about blood and guts. I'd been fascinated for years with the possibility of medicine. I thought about maybe becoming a doctor. It was this, this message just totally took over my body. This is wrong. So this, so this was in basic training? This was in basic training okay. in Fort McClellan, Alabama. Did you tell anybody this or did you just keep going? I knew right away that there were people who were able to become conscientious objectors by going through a very serpentine military process. I also knew right away I wouldn't be able to stand the gaff. I think at that point I was emotionally probably 14 or 15 years old. My body was eight, barely 18. My head was somewhere in the low 20s. And I wouldn't be able to stand up for the fight. I just, I could tell that from the beginning without even having to think about it. Uh -huh. And so I kind of just went along until they shoved me out. Several years later, and I was very glad to get out, and that's part of the story. Very quickly after I got home, I wrote a letter to the draft board. There, there was the draft still. And I let them know in writing that I was a veteran, I had just come back, and there was no way whatever, no matter what it was, I would never, ever go back into the military. Period. End of discussion. Uh, so, there's this gap between boot camp and uh, writing a letter to uh, your draft board as a veteran. Yeah. Were there any experiences between them that reinforced or helped crystallize this view that you there had? There was one. About a year after that basic training, I had been shipped to Germany. I was in the Army of Occupation. We were in a little town. I had no idea what, where it was exactly. And I had a day off. And I liked to walk, and it was a gorgeous day, probably in June. The sun was shining, the air was balmy, all things were quiet, the flowers were out. And so I started to walk away from the village. And I saw a hill over here on my left and, and said, gee, if I go up on that hill, I can get a better view of this whole territory around here. And so I shifted off the road and started going up the hill. And then I became aware that off to my right, on a road coming and crossing in front, but several hundred yards away, there was an army truck going down that road, and the first thing I thought was, oh, there's probably a sergeant in there, and he's looking for more guys to go on some kind of a work detail. And that's not what I want to do with my day. So I changed my course a little to get up into the trees at the top, toward the top of the hill. What I didn't know was that some displaced persons, people who'd been kidnapped by the Germans, to work the fields and work in the factories, and now were loose because the war was over, <clears throat> had spotted me. And here's this guy, a young man, in an army uniform, and he's obviously trying to get away from that military truck. Maybe we ought to look into this would probably went through their mind. I wasn't aware of them at that point, but as I went further up the hill, I turned again to look and enjoy the view. I saw them, and they were coming up the hill toward me. I resumed going on up and went back into the, behind the trees, probably 20 or 30 feet, and said, gee, it'd be fun to talk to these people, find out where they're from, and, and see what was going on with them. So I waited for them to come up, which they did. There were probably five of them. And we got to talking, and all of this was in German. I had learned some German in high school, and they had learned German, of course, to some extent, being the workers. They wanted to know who I was, what I was up to, you know, why was I here, da 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 da, da all this kind of thing. When we were going back and forth, one of them seemed to be the best 
probably the best German speaker. Then I noticed that he had a little silver pistol in his right hand. And it was just hanging, his arm was loose. And I thought, gee, I'd kind of like to see that. At that time, I was interested in guns. I was in the Army and did it. And I did not have a gun with me, by the way. Not my day off. And so I stepped forward about one pace and put my hand out and said, Ich wünsche deine Pistole, diese Pistole sehen. I want this, I'd like to see your pistol. I knew he probably wouldn't give it to me, but I also wanted to make the gesture. He didn't, you know. I stepped back, and the whole atmosphere changed. They started talking more to each other. They had been listening to our conversation with the guy with the pistol, the spokesperson. Pretty soon I began to see heads nodding, <clears throat> and I can't remember any of the conversation itself, but it wasn't very long, probably a minute before they started saying goodbye, and they turned and they walked off back down the hill. They could have jumped me, and there's no question about it. There are more of them, and I wasn't looking for a fight at all. That's my story there. Yes? So, I want to wrap up with, with yeah. one more question. Yeah. Uh, what we hope to do is, is help our young people understand mm -hmm. the importance of peace, and alternatives to war. What message might you have to them? Well, I can think of several things. The first one I think of right now is, is very specific. I left the Army with very poor views about the Army. It was the most dehumanizing experience of my entire life. I became a number. Since that time, I've had a lot of experience in prisons, and I've been with a lot of inmates in the Alternatives to Violence Project. There's a lot of similarities. In both places, you wear what they want you to wear. In both places, you eat what they want you to eat. In both places, you do what they say. End of discussion. So you become a number, a thing that's being moved around by other people. I found it a very difficult experience. I'd say that and I would also say there's a number of kinds of things you can do aside from just fight. And there are ways of fighting. Mahatma Gandhi led the way in many ways many forms. Um, patience, persistence, look for something that's a common goal, a commonality between you and whoever is the with the problem that you're having. And look for the good side. You know, if I look for the good in them and find that and speak to that. Granted, this is personal. Now, how to end wars between nation states, which are mostly run by money, interests, one way or another, that's not a nation, that's not a kind of thing that I know very much about. But I know there are a lot of things that you can do on a personal level, wherein you can take something that could energize itself into a real all-out conflict. If you can see that coming and you can speak to the good side of whatever the issue is, the good in that person, keep it from starting, from escalating. So. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for your comments and yeah. thank you for all your support with Quaker House.